Jenny is a native of Texas, and she was one of the first full-time women sports writers in the country who left the field mid-career to pursue a path in communications and public relations. And through the years, Jenny has hiked, she's climbed, she's kayaked, she's skied, and she's poked her way through the outdoors and developed a passion for all things natural. A move to the middle of the woods in Bark Hampstead about 16 years ago brought her into an environment filled with bears and other wildlife. And so she lives in a house surrounded by people's state forests. She observes a large population of black bears and she supplies field notes and photographs on them to DEEP, which is the Department of Environmental um, Education, right? Um, and she's a bear bio to, she provides this information to the deep bear biologist. Her affinity for this magnificent creature has led her out west to participate in a grizzly research mission in Montana and to become a master wildlife conservationist with the State Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, which is deep. I mispronounced it before. So for which of this, she gives almost 100 talks yearly and volunteers monitoring the local bear population. As an MWC, she also, along with many other activities, she serves as a bald eagle interpreter for the Chapag Dam Eagle Viewing Area and the Essex Steam Trains Eagle Flyer, and she's created and runs the Bark Hampstead Earth Day Nature Festival, a yearly event on the last Sunday in April that draws an average of 800 people to People's State Forest. So we should all remember that. That would be a nice event to go to. I, I wasn't well, aware. We could have it this year, but it's all free, and there's a lot of great stuff there, and it ends with a Birds of Prey show, so... Well, that sounds fantastic. I, I love that area. And sometimes we take our bikes out there to bike. So that would be a great thing to do. And also, if Jenny didn't have enough to do, she is chairman of the Bark Hampstead Conservation Commission and a member of the Bark Hampstead Economic Development Commission. And she's on the boards of the Farmington River Watershed Association, the Friends of American Legion and People State Forest the Friends of Connecticut State Parks, and the Western Connecticut Tourism District. She also maintains the Facebook pages of the Town of Bark Hampstead and the Bark Hampstead Historical Society. So she keeps very busy, but I can tell you that last week I attended a uh, webinar she gave on bobcats, and this lady knows her stuff. It's very interesting. And so today we're going to talk about it's a bird, it's a plane, no, it's an eagle. And bald eagles were once so endangered that many considered whether to replace them as America's national symbol. The ongoing story of their recovery as a species and Connecticut's healthy eagle population is really a comeback story worth hearing. So I hope that you will join Jenny tonight. Remember, she's a master wildlife conservationist and hear her talk about these magnificent birds of prey that so fascinate onlookers and their valuable contributions to our ecosystem. Ginny will discuss and give a slideshow presentation on the bald eagle and its researching population in Connecticut. And after she is finished, we will have a Q&A. So as, she go, as we go along, Put your questions in the chat box and we'll take record of them and we will uh, have them, we will question, use those questions and ask them to Jenny. If they're duplicates, we'll try to combine them together. And just before Jenny goes on, we would like to give a little shout out to the Town of Bloomfield Leisure Services and the Wintonberry Land Trust, who are both co-sponsors for this event. And Jenny, just hold on a few more seconds while Matt and I just have a few more things to do before we start. Okay, Matt. Um, so just wanted to talk uh, briefly about some upcoming programs that we have coming up uh, this Friday, February 4th. Uh, starting at six o'clock, we have a tie-dye night at the Recreation Center. So if you have any items within reason that you'd like to tie-dye, 
uh, please sign up for the program. Uh, it is $10 uh, for a resident and you can bring whatever materials you have, t-shirts, those types of things and tie dye them at the center. Um, next Friday, we've got a Tate night party um, with the senior services department and they'll have um, snacks and they'll have a project um, and everybody will go home with a painting that night. Um, also check out, we've got yoga classes, um, Zumba classes, and we've got some cooking classes uh, for the kids. So come and check those out as well. And back to you, Sharon. Okay, thank you, Matt. And a little bit about the Wittenberry Land Trust. So we have a free winter outing coming up at the Spear Preserve, which is an upland forest surrounded by open land and the MDC Reservoir property. It's a snowshoe event. It's on February 19th, 9.30 to 11. It usually runs one and a half to two hours. And uh, you can sign up for more details at wintonberrylandtrust.org. And everything's there and you can register there. And I can tell you, I went on that uh, uh, shoe uh, we went on that last year and it was excellent. The snow was beautiful. The trees, the evergreen trees dripping with little snowflakes. It had snowed the day before. And it, it's, it's easy. It's not hard. It's not a lot of hills, but you really feel like, okay, if you can't go on a vacation somewhere, you go out on these, uh, this forest and you have this wonderful feeling that you know, you're on a little mini vacation and it's good exercise for you too. So that's my event that's coming up for the Land Trust. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny and take it away, Jenny. Okay, I just want to first uh, express my gratitude. I, I love to talk about wildlife, the environment. I think it, in these days, it's really, really important. And if you're here, I know you have an interest in these things and we all have to do what we can to help preserve them. That's why Land Trust and uh, friends groups are so valuable because they can save the land and they can supplement what the state may not be able to do, uh, you know, to protect our wildlife and our environment. So uh, kudos to the Wintonbury Land Trust. Okay, the bald eagles. Uh, I call them the comeback raptors and uh, after you listen to my talk, you'll see why. Uh, at one point they were very close to being extinct and, and they definitely were endangered in the early 60s, but We've done some things that have really protected them and other uh, animals, and it's a great story. Um, so there's perhaps no other bird in the history of mankind that has inspired gods and man as the eagle. Uh, in early days, we're talking pretty much about the golden eagle, but the history of the eagle as a supreme being is very important. Uh, the Bible and philosophers such as Aristotle and Pliny and even Shakespeare and my leaders like Alexander the Great, they revered this bird of prey and uh, praised its independent singularity. Uh, whenever you see a statue of Zeus or, or, or a print or painting, uh, he always has his eagle nearby. Uh, that was called the Aquila, which is Latin for eagle. It was the king of the birds and it was believed that it could ascend above the storm and become the messenger of gods. Uh, the bald eagle actually can fly up to 10,000 feet I've never seen one out of an airplane, but it could be something people have seen. Uh, anyway, so uh, Odin uh, and the tribes of Germania, this is one of the helmets, and it's, as you see, an eagle helmet. Uh, in scripture, there's a lot of uh, notations about eagles. Uh, of course, that would be a golden eagle, not a bald eagle. They refer to those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. Many poets say the same thing. Uh, just a very, very uh, powerful uh, species. Uh, Rome's legions, never without their Aquila. It was a golden standard they carried, and that signified the ferocity, strength, and power of the eagle. You can see it there in the upper right hand. And before they went into battle, a soldier was assigned to carry this standard, and if he fell, somebody else would have to pick it up, much like a battle flag, and bear it on onward. Before Caesar would go into battle, he would have his legions come before him and he would sanctify the golden eagle. We all know he thinks he was a god. So uh, as you can see, that golden eagle is gripping thunderbolts in its powerful talons and set to take flight against the enemies of Rome. 
Um, many, many uh, cultures like Babylonia, the Native Americans uh, all revered the eagle. Uh, a lot of it uh, represented the sun and the power of life um, and the ability to rise above uh, humanity. Uh, here's some of the uh, countries that use eagles in their symbols. Um, a lot of times double-headed double eagle in some of the uh, European countries. Uh, our neighbor to the um, below us, Mexico, they have um, their, their symbol is the um, golden eagle. And the way that uh, came about was the Aztecs were looking for a place to build their city. And they said that they were going to build wherever they saw an eagle on a cactus. So they were going all around and they came up on the site of what is now Mexico City. And it was surrounded by water. So they had to build little, uh, a little island, little uh, land uh, parts out to it. And that became Mexico City. Uh, they added the uh, snake later on because of its fierceness. Uh, so very beautiful flag. Uh, here's some other countries uh, that have, uh, that's the, that's the white-headed fish eagle in the Re Republic of Sudan. Uh, the Austrian double-headed eagle goes way back to Constantinople. Uh, and uh, Poland has had the eagle for a long time. So as you can see, you'll see a few more countries here uh, that do use the golden eagle as their. Um, I wanted to say one thing about, one last thing about the eagles, and we'll talk about the species of eagles. The, the ancient philosopher Pliny, he said of the eagle, I'm going to quote him, that she beats her young ones while in an unfledged state, that means they're in the nest, with its wings and forces them from time to time to look steadily upon the rays of the sun. And if she sees either of them wink or even their eyes water, she'll throw it headline, headlong out of the nest as being spurious and degenerate, while on the other hand, she'll raise the one whose gaze remained fixed and steady. So <laughs> that's, that's a pretty tough description of a uh, mother eagle. So anyway, there are uh, more than 60 species of eagles in the world. Uh, America, it, the North America is home to two, the bald eagle and the golden eagle. Uh, eagles are large birds of prey, which are members of the bird family Acipitridae. I took five uh, years of Latin, but I still can't pronounce it. But anyway, uh, but most of the 60 species occur in Eurasia and Africa. Uh, the Stellar's eagle, which we'll talk about the one that has come to Maine and Massachusetts, it's the heaviest. It can weigh up to 20 pounds and lives in eastern Russia and uh, South Korea and ja Japan. Um, the largest eagle in the Americas is the harpy eagle there on the right. Uh, it's also the most powerful raptor in the Americas, bigger even than the golden eagle. Its name it refers to the harpies of Greek mythology, monsters in the form of a bird with a human face. And I kind of, if you look at that, it's not, kind of not far off, is it? Um, the females can be three and a half feet in length when they're sitting, and they weigh just under 20 pounds. The male is one third her size, and this is pretty true of most birds of prey. Um, their lifespan can be up to 30 years uh, in the wild. They hunt during the day, and they take uh, medium-sized animals such as monkeys and sloths. Um, the smallest eagle in the world is down on the left there. The south, their great Nicobar serpent eagle from Nicobar, an island in India. It's only one pound and 16 inches in length. Compare that to the weight of a red-tailed hawk, which is one and a half to three and a half pounds and 17 to 25 inches length. So obviously it isn't size that makes an eagle an eagle. So the great Nicopar serpent eagle is kind of the size of our sparrow hawk or our kestrel. Uh, interesting story, speaking of the stellar sea eagle, I was lucky enough to have a friend, Carl Walsh, who grew up in South uh, Windsor, and he allowed me to use these photos. He lives in Maine. And he got that spectacular photo of a bald eagle flying over the, uh, the Stellar's eagle. And as you can see, the, uh, the bald eagle looked kind of nonchalant, <laughs> you know, like, oh, I'm not noticing you. And the Stellar's eagle is just looking up at it. Uh, the journey of this vagrant Stellar sea eagle started more than a year ago and has left bird watchers in awe. Uh, it was seen in Taunton, Mass. on the Taunton River in December 20th, 2021. And uh, Folks were just so excited. Of course, all the birders go there to see it. 
Uh, it was perched in a tree not far from two immature bald eagles. Uh, folks flocked there, and yes, I will use that pun, to see this astounding bird. And uh, even uh, David Selby, the famous uh, bird uh, ornithologist and illustrator, um, went there and did draw pictures of it. So uh, vagrancy is a tendency for birds to show up far outside their normal range, and it's one of the most exciting aspects of birding. Um, so this uh, stellar sea eagle is the epitome of a vagrant bird because it has been tracked across North America since it was spotted more than a year ago in Alaska. It went from Alaska to southeastern Texas, which is some people are skeptical of that because they had it standing on this uh, kind of stick that was sticking up out of the ground <laughs> in pretty desolate Texas. But then from there, it went to eastern Canada, New Brunswick, uh, Prince Edward Island, and then appeared in New England, where it is still right now. Uh, so pretty fascinating story. Uh, here's a sound it makes. Well, we won't, we, we probably won't hear that here, but who knows, it might decide to come to Connecticut. Uh, here's another photo that uh, Carl took. Car Carl is a photographer. I don't get any commissions. Uh, he does sell his work and he is just like an excellent photographer. He has a Facebook page and uh, I would uh, encourage you to look and see what he gets. He's taken a bunch of pictures of snowy owls of late. Um, here's the eagles of the world. These are not to scale, but it just kind of shows you a, the different looks of them all. Uh, the golden eagle, which we'll talk about later, and of course, American bald eagle. And as you can see on the bottom right, the American fish eagle that has a similar look, uh, the African fish eagle, I'm sorry. And uh, I saw the white-headed eagle in Scotland. Uh, pretty incredible as I saw two golden eagles flying into the sunset. That was pretty amazing. For you literary buffs, the harpy eagle and the myth mythical phoenix inspired the design of fox the Phoenix in the Harry Potter series. Dumbledore's pet Phoenix uh, that peri periodically bursts into flame shares his name with the most infamous traitor in English history, Guy Fawkes. Uh, Guy Fawkes um, uh, tried to blow up Parliament and he was thwarted on November 5th. So they have a great huge bonfires and all kinds of big parties uh, on Guy Fawkes Day on November 5th. Apparently using Fox as the name for this bird was a joke on the author's part. Uh, in ancient Greek folklore, a phoenix, as you know, is a long-lived bird. It's associated with the sun and obtains new life by arising from the ashes of its predecessor. So just a little sidelight on that bird. So the golden eagle is a quite spectacular bird. We will see them here in Connecticut generally in the winter. Uh, they'll come... Uh, Eagles in general only migrate as far as they have to go to find food. Uh, so we oftentimes get the uh, golden eagle generally in the northwestern part of the state, although there have been reports of it more down near the shore uh, once or twice this year. So um, again, in the U.S., we have the golden and the bald eagle. Uh, the bald eagle is only found in North America, and its greatest con concentrations are in Alaska, where there's probably about 30,000 individual birds. Um, the golden eagle can be found not only all over North America, but Europe, North Africa, and Asia. So it's truly a worldwide bird. Uh, its length is about three feet. It can weigh up to 14 pounds with a wingspan of up to seven feet. As predators, it's a carnivore and the more ferocious of the two birds. It preys on small mammals <clears throat> and has been known to attack livestock and small domestic animals such as dogs and cats. But it is a solitary bird and it does prefer high mountainous areas, so not likely it's gonna come and snatch your poodle. Uh, their range can cover up to 165 miles. So it, they're the fastest eagle in the world. And when they're beaming down on prey, meaning diving, they can dive up to 200 miles per hour. There's only one bird of prey faster, and that's the peregrine falcon, which can dive at speeds up to 245 miles per hour. I always think, though, the peregrine is so small compared to the golden eagle. I can't even imagine that eagle when it goes and hits its prey coming at 200 miles per hour. I imagine it uses those big wings to kind of slow down like airplanes putting their little flaps down. 
the comparison, uh, the bald eagles on the left, on the right is an immature, I'm sorry, uh, golden eagles on the left, on the right is an immature bald eagle. Uh, a lot of times it is mistaken for a golden eagle. <laughs> One important thing to look at is if you'll see the head and tail of the bald eagle on the right, they're almost equidistant from the wings, whereas the golden eagle has a shorter head. So that's one good way to identify them. If you're looking at a vulture, which look like pretty darn big birds when you're looking up in the sky, <clears throat> the turkey vulture tends to uh, have its wings in a V and rocks as it moves along. Uh, so that's another good way to tell them apart. Uh, the bald eagle has, a, as I said, a bigger head and it has a yellow hooked beak once it reaches five years old. As you can see, this one on the right, has a little dark beak because it takes them till they're five to get their full uh, white head and tail and uh, yellow beak. Uh, the uh, golden eagle has a smaller head and a black hook, hooked beak. Uh, so again, these two can be confused. The younger immature golden eagles will have real distinct white bands underneath like this. And as they get older, they'll, they'll disappear but still be little tiny white spots um, on them. Here you can see a uh, difference uh, on the right are the immature bald eagles, which we'll talk about that whole aging process. And on the left, the golden eagle. Uh, juvenile bald eagles are a mixture of brown and white. They have different, uh, like our fingerprints, their patterning of uh, white and dark can be different, uh, but their beaks will always be um, yellow and their eyes dark and, until they get older. Um, as I said, they do reach their maturity between four and five years when they will get the uh, yellow beak, the white head, and the white tail. Another key difference between the two species is their color. Bald eagles look almost black when you're looking at them. Uh, their body is dark brown, but it's really contrasted by the white heads and tail, which make them look darker. Uh, the golden eagle is, is definitely brown. It has golden highlights on the back of its head and the neck, thus the name. When I was hiking in the Highlands in Scotland at sunset, I was like, boy, I'd love to see a golden eagle. And right at sunset, two golden eagles flew over us and you could see that gold on the back of their head. It was just magnificent. Uh, so here's the golden eagle range. Uh, the red is where they breed. Uh, the um, purple is year round. So you can see our, our Western part of our country has a lot of uh, the eagles. Um, and then migration. So you see uh, they do migrate down to us and into New York State. Um, so it's, it's kind of quite spectacular to see one and not uncommon if you're in, like I said, the northwestern part of the state or even along the Hudson River, you know, over just over the New York State line. Uh, here's the bald eagle range. Breeding would be the red. Uh, now they need to redo this map. A lot of the, a lot of these, uh, data we get from whether it's the national uh, data or state is a little behind because the biologists are really so very busy studying all these species that you know it takes a while to get into the office and create things like this. So uh, we, we do have breeding uh, eagles now and as does all of New England. So uh, you'll see that later. Um, so try to pronounce that Latin word, I'm not going to, but I put it there so you could see it. So this is the bald eagle. Uh, this is a picture of one I got on the Farmington River. I don't have mega lenses, so I'm happy with whatever I get. Uh, I learned that the, I never hunted, but I did trap shooting, which are clay pigeons that you shoot when they're thrown in the air from a building. And I was pretty good at that, but I found out that taught me how to follow a bird to get a good photo because you have to lead, you know, in front of them a little bit. So, so my trap shooting days helped me get photos of the birds. So, um, so I, I always like to include literature. I'm a literature literary girl. So there's an eagle in me that wants to soar and there is a hippopotamus in me that wants to wallow in the mud. And isn't that really true of all of us? You know, as part of the times we're like, oh, you know, like Eeyore or something, but then other times, Something really makes us joyous and, and uh, we really want to soar. So again, through the centuries, eagles have been a very powerful symbol. So I wanted to show you some of my favorite eagle quotes. <clears throat> again, to Native Americans, it was a very powerful symbol. Crazy Horse said, a great vision is needed and the man who has it must follow it as the eagle seeks the deep blue of the sky. 
And then probably one of the most famous uh, quotes using an eagle, Houston Tranquility Base here, the eagle has landed. Now I can tell you that Neil Armstrong didn't make this up. There are a lot of suited people around the table, probably back then guys, no offense, but, and they are all throwing out all these quotes of what they think, you know, would be the best thing to say when they land. Now, Neil Armstrong may have said, you know, since the vessel was named that, that to say that, but probably not. Uh, but anyway, it's still a quote that, especially people my age uh, really remember. Uh, so it's hard to soar with the eagles when you're surrounded by turkeys. Uh, Longfellow Deeds is known for writing the longest and worst paragraph in history, uh, even longer than William Faulkner's uh, first paragraph of The Bear, which is a very good short story, by the way. Uh, and that brings me to Ben Franklin and the turkey. I want to tell you the true story about that. As most of you know, Ben Franklin was erudite, sophisticated, he was a diplomat, he was a genius, an inventor, a writer, an author, but when it came down to it, he was a very practical man. After the Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1776, it decided that it need, needed a seal to represent the new country. So it tasked Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson uh, with the task of trying to design a seal. Each man submitted a proposal, but their designs were awful, blandly allegorical, and pedantic, and I'll show you those. After they'd completed their work, um, this is what we got. So the one on the left is John Adams' uh, seal that he suggested. He suggested an illustration depicting the choice of Hercules. This Greek allegory has Hercules deciding whether he'll take the path of female pleasure or take the path of virtue. Imagine putting that on a coin. Uh, Jefferson wanted on the bottom left here, an illustration of the Israelites exodus out of slavery and bondage from Egypt for the front of his seal. Uh, again, imagine that. Then Franklin had a similar idea to Jefferson's. He wanted to illustrate a scene from the exodus of the Israelites. He said the seal would show Moses parting the Red Sea with the Pharaoh and his chariots being overwhelmed by the waters. Uh, so the, the Continental Congress was just uh, put out by all this and just tabled it for a while. So then they decided that, you know, they let it lie on the table. But then they decided to go to Charles Thompson, who was the only secretary that the Continental Congress ever had. Um, he was so well regarded that if he signed anything, folks would say, here comes the truth. In fact, his name is the only other name with John Hancock on the Declaration of Independence. Uh, so after two more committees had failed to come up with a design, they went to Charles Thompson. He was a doodler. I hope he wasn't doodling on official documents, but he, did, he, he could draw. And so they asked him to create a design. Uh, so he, did, he worked on it and... Here's what he came up with in the top left. Um, and it was approved by Congress in 1782. It was a combination of three elements provided by all three of the committees. Um, the bottom right is the one that was adopted and it was published in 1787 in the Columbian Magazine. Uh, tell you a little bit of that's what we see today. And here's to tell you a little bit about the symbols in case you don't know what everything means. Very interesting in, in what finally evolved as our seal, there's 13 represented in everything. As you see, uh, each star and stripe have, there's 13, uh, the original colonies, uh, there's 13 arrows prepared to defend liberty. The escutcheon has the white and the red and 13. Uh, the olive branch has 13. Uh, the seal up at the top has 13 stars. Uh, so they have the eagle looking towards the olive branch seeking peace. Uh, but on the right, they are prepared to uh, defend liberty and the stripes. The white signifies purity and innocence and the red, hardiness and valor. Uh, so as you see, as I said, um, the next time you take out your wallet, you'll see this or uh, you blast Hotel California by the Eagles or catch up on Philadelphia football. You'll just know how far that symbolism has traveled um, in our world. Um, so here's the story about Franklin and the turkey. 
A few years later, there's the Order of the Cincinnatus, which is a group of uh, Revolutionary War veterans, and they wanted to come up with a seal. And so Franklin proposed to them the turkey, and he wrote to his daughter uh, in a letter in 1784, and he panned the eagle, and he said uh, this, I wish the bald eagle had not been chosen as the representative of our country. He is a bird of bad moral character, like those among men who live by sharping and robbing. He is generally poor and often very lousy. The turkey is a much more respectable bird and with all the true original Native America now, obviously, uh, so was the bald eagle, a Native of America, but uh, he, he really uh, was not happy with that choice. Uh, so this is how uh, the U.S. Diplomacy Center says this is why they think people began to think that um, Franklin wanted the turkey for our, our symbol. Uh, in the 1962 New Yorker, an artist wrote, uh, decided near Thanksgiving, let's see what the seal would look like with the turkey. So he drew this and it was illustrated and, you know, it got a lot of uh, publicity. And uh, so it is in the U.S. Diplomacy Center. And this is what they think helped popularize, uh, popularize Franklin's preference for the turkey. So much ado about nothing, but just trying to set the record straight there. Um, so in the early days, uh, when the colonists came, they decimated the uh, wildlife population, particularly birds and other predators that they considered dangerous to their livestock and to their, their own selves. Uh, before the settlers did come to America's shore, bald eagles may have numbered half a million or more. They were just all over the place. They existed along the Atlantic from Labrador to the tip of Florida, along the Pacific from Baja, California to Alaska, they inhabited every large river and concentration of lakes within North America. They nested in 45 of the 48 states. Uh, one researcher estimated an eagle nest for every mile of shore along Chesapeake Bay. Um, but when, when the colonists came, they, they extirpated, which meant pushed out all of our, a lot of our native predators from, from native wolves to mountain lions, uh, to, to bears, to wild turkeys. Whereas the Native Americans who were actually farmers too, before the colonists, they'd only take what they needed. You know, they'd shoot what they needed when they needed it. They would cut lumber when they needed it. Uh, we were all over 90% forested when the colonists came here. Uh, and then we were down to like 30% uh, forested by the mid 1850s when farming kind of moved out west. Uh, the colonists sent a lot of the wood overseas for masts, for ships and for furniture. And they also, of course, built their homesteads with them. Uh, so they really didn't care to have any wildlife around because they felt it was a threat to them and to their uh, animals. So. Uh, bald eagles population declined uh, also and kept declining into the 20th century. And in the early 60s, bald eagle breeding pairs in the lower uh, 48 reached a low number of 400, which you'll see is just amazing. Uh, after World War II, uh, they decided to start dusting crops for insects with DDT. Uh, that's another one of those long names. I don't even put it there, but if you like chemistry, there's the chemical uh, <laughs> formula for it. Um, it was held as a new pesticide to control mosquitoes and other insects. And I remember growing up on a ranch in Texas. Uh, we didn't spray ours, but uh, I remember seeing these crop dusters come over. Uh, the use of these during the 50s and 60s uh, became a dangerous hazard. Uh, the residue of the DDT accumulated in fish, which is a major food, food source of eagles. And these residues then accumulated in, in the eagles that ate the fish and caused the thinning of their eggshells. Uh, the residue of DDT also washed into nearby waterways where plants, insects, and fish absorbed it. So it didn't just affect bald eagles, it affected all kinds of fish and insects. Uh, so it was pretty, pretty bad. And I can imagine it must have affected us some too. Uh, so here's some of the eggs not to scale because obviously a bald eagle egg would be much larger than peregrine falcon. But here's kind of what, uh, so the mallard eggs, the mallard sits on it, they squash. Uh, you can see that the uh, bald eagle eggs really never developed. So um, eggs that were not crushed during incubation did not hatch uh, because of the high levels of DDT. Uh, Large quantities of DDT was discovered in fatty tissues and gonads of dead bald eagles. And that 
uh, was thought to probably have made them become infertile. So uh, before it was banned in 1972 by the Environmental Protection Association, 1 trillion, 350 billion pounds of DDT had been produced in North America. Pretty incredible. Uh, it also would cause uh, reproductive disorders and nervous system disorders in animals. But then Rachel Carson came along. Uh, if you're in my age bracket, you probably read Silent Spring. I read it in junior high, I think. As amazing as it may seem, this allegorical novel led to the banning of DDT and was a springboard for the environmental movement. Her book uh, was first published in The New Yorker in 1962, lots of things happening that year. Uh, she is credit, credited as the indirect founder of the American environmental movement. Uh, this uh, brought pesticide use to public attention and led to the banning of DDT. And it did support the creation of environmental organizations and other legislation. She did have a lot of death threats because of what she wrote. Um, but it did tell a real life story of how bird populations across the country we're suffering as a result of the widespread application of DDT. Uh, so very brave woman and the book did a, did a lot. She also wrote The Sea Around Us and The Edge of the Sea. Uh, I recommend you reading her writing is very, very awesome. So luckily for the birds, Silent Spring did cause a stir. Uh, and then right after that, uh, the world's, uh, the Environmental Defense Fund was formed in 19, and uh, led to all kinds of things. These are laws that protect our eagles. Uh, their recovery is perhaps the best known example of how our environmental laws work. Uh, when uh, the Lacey Act is, was enacted in 1900 when people were shooting all kinds of birds, even herons for their feathers. So that protects them. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 protects all migrating birds. Uh, it's a, a big umbrella of protections. Uh, technically, it makes it also illegal to even pick up a blue jay feather. Uh, but, you know, are you going to tell your little son you can't have that blue jay feather? <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, uh, and then the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. At first in 1940, it was the Bald Eagle Protection Act, and the, the, uh, then the uh, Golden Eagles were added to that later. So these led to helping protect these species a lot. Uh, this is an eagle I got on a kayak on a very windy lake in New Hampshire, but it just kind of sat there and let me take its picture and I was happy with my little camera. So uh, if you get out on a boat, you can really see them. Um, so the largest, as I said, eagle population in, Amer in America is in Alaska with 30,000 birds. In the lower 48 states, Minnesota and Florida follow in the largest numbers. And again, it's truly a comeback raptor. Uh, not very, very few animals ever escape the distinction of being endangered and come off of that list. Uh, only a handful of large species have fought their way back. And uh, those include the American alligator and the uh, California gray whale. Uh, today, it's estimated there are 316,700 bald eagles in the lower 48 states. That was during 2019 breeding, the last season, the last time they were counted. And that included more than 71,400 breeding pairs, which is a way that they do count species like uh, by breeding pairs. Because that if you don't have a breeding, if you don't have a breeding population of some wildlife species, then you really don't have your own population. Uh, Compare that with just 72,000 total eagles and only 30,000 breeding pairs in 2009. Imagine the growth uh, there. And again, in the early 60s, there were only 400 breeding pairs in the lower 48. So pretty incredible. Um, here are our 2020 statewide uh, midwinter eagle survey results. And I'm all for people being citizen scientists. And you guys can, if you go in... Uh, November to the DEP website and Google Eagles, you can you can sign up for a midwinter eagle survey here in Connecticut. It's always the second Saturday in January, usually cold, and you will be assigned a place to watch for eagles from seven in the morning to 11. Pretty fun, and this is how we get these numbers. It helps put in with data to determine our populations. Uh, so you can see there were in 2020, 
230 volunteers that covered 588 miles of shoreline. That includes whether it's rivers or lakes or ocean. Observation sites, 150. Bald eagles seen, 181. Of these 181, obviously some are not our resident population because Connecticut tends to get eagles. When we had no nesting pairs, we'd get eagles from Quabbin, from Maine, from you know up north, uh, and we still do because we tend to have open water when a lot of places do not. And remember I told you, eagles only migrate as far as they have to go to find food. Uh, here's like the first page of the survey farm. And in late November, if you email brian.hess at ct.gov, he's the one who runs this. And you can say, hey, I live in Bloomfield. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to do the midwinter survey. And all you do is fill out a form. You got to give the temperature, the wind, you know, and then you see the eagle. You know, if you're covering a three mile area, you just say where it was. It's really kind of fun and it's fun to do with somebody. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, so they started this, uh, the midwinter bald eagle survey in 1979. And uh, now the um, US Geological Survey and the Army Corps of Engineers conduct this every year. So uh, the purpose of it again, as I said, is to monitor the status of the bald eagle wintering populations in this, the lower 48. And that way they can estimate national and regional count trends overall and by age class. So anyway, it's kind of fun to do. So I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, any kind of citizen science project is, is fun and, and good to get involved with because, you know, there's, as I said, there's a limited another number of biologists that are trying to do all this stuff and sometimes helping out uh, can be a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> so these are breeding season results for 2020. And if you'll look down there at 2010, we only had 23 breeding pairs. Uh, last year, uh, in tw I'm sorry, in 2020, we had 72 active territories. And out of those, 47 had successful nests. And they produced 88 chicks. Uh, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, there are 11 new territories in 2020. We haven't got 2021 results yet. Uh, COVID kind of affected the uh, ability to get out and about uh, for nest watchers and things, but this is a, a great, uh, great growth. Uh, <clears throat> here's a map from 2018. Uh, unfortunately, you do not have a nest. Simsbury does on the Farmington River. Uh, you can see that there are a lot of nests down the C Connecticut River corridor there. Uh, and uh, pretty, pretty uh, successful. Uh, when you consider that in 1990, we had no nesting pairs and the first nesting pair was here in my town, Bark Hampstead in 1992, and that was on the Bark Hampstead Reservoir. So even though you say, well, 92 to 2021, that's a long time, that uh, 2022, that doesn't seem like very good growth. But, you know, when you consider only 50% of eagles survive their first year, uh, then, you know, it's, it's pretty darn good growth. So here's, this is a very out of focus, bad 2019, but again, you can see uh, Simsbury still has a nest but not you. So, so here's like the history kind of 1950s, there were no nesting eagles in Connecticut. 1992, they were endangered in Connecticut. And that's when the first nesting pair showed up in Bar Campstead. And in 2010, we downgraded them to threaten. Uh, as you can see, even though there's a bow there in that limb, you can see the, the eagle on the left is um, larger. She's a female. She has a very unusual uh, dark colors in her white tail. She is full, full grown and uh, it's just some uh, weird nominally. Uh, my friend Cheryl Anderson, who's a great photographer, she uh, has let me use some of her photos. So that's one of hers. Uh, here's just the history of the bald eagle here in our country. Uh, so you can see in 73, they were an endangered species, lowered to threaten in 95, and then they were taken off the list in 2007. But they're still protected by those statutes and everything I told you about. Oh. So now there are dangers, other dangers to eagles uh, and other animals and birds. Millions and millions of Birds of prey and bats are killed by wind turbines. Um, they're slaughtering millions annually. Uh, the companies have been given a 30-year exemption from the federal government 
for if they kill eagles. Uh, green en energy is commendable and they are trying to come up with technology that will help uh, the birds not fly into this where actually I was told where they can sense it and be turned off, you know, in time when birds are flying through, but that sounds difficult to me, but um, hopefully they do come up with something. Um, the electrical companies are working hard at trying to not get birds, birds of prey electrocuted, uh, especially immature young juvenile eagles in their first year will go up onto like one of those power uh, company towers. And if they put one foot on a live wire and one on a ground wire, it can electrocute them. Uh, so they're putting these little triangles up to hope, hopefully deter some of those birds from hanging out there. Um, most recreational hunters are law abiding and safety conscious, but we do have a number of poachers who do kill um, bald eagles uh, and sell their feathers and talons on the black market. Uh, only Native Americans are allowed to have an eagle feather. So if you went to Sitka, Alaska and saw eagles around like pigeons, which they are there, and there's usually feathers on the ground. It's not, a, not legal really to take them. And even the Native Americans have to apply to get them to use for their ceremonial dances and healing and other purposes. Um, another huge thing that's killing birds of prey and other animals now is lead poisoning. Uh, say if a deer is killed by a hunter, the hunter dresses it in the field, but leaves the carcass. The carcass still has the bullet in it just a tiny bit of that lead that seeps into the body there can, can make an eagle die. And so it can also kill other animals. Um, less adapted hunting, the young eagles are more likely to eat dead stuff and possibly ingest poison meat used to bait wolves and coyotes. So uh, the biggest thing that kills a lot of our animals in our state, guess what, us, collisions with vehicles. Um, also, uh, using poisons for mice. I know this has been a horrible mice year, but please use those snap traps uh, or there are, have a heart traps, but you have to have a lot of those things around. But if you do use snap traps, hey, go set those uh, dead mice out in the woods and they'll be gone in less than an hour. Uh, everything eats mice from chipmunks to other mice to bigger things like bobcats. So I say circle of life. So, um, so there are a lot of things that, that our animal species have to uh, avoid. Uh, how long can they live? Uh, for a large bird with no natural, sorry, uh, with no natural predators, uh, their death rate is quite high. Uh, again, the juveniles only survive 50% their first year as compared to our black bears who about 75% survive their first year. Um, <clears throat> But after the first year, the bald eagle stands a better chance of living a full lifestyle and, and could live up to 15, 20 years in the wild. Uh, there was not one noted that was over 30 years old, uh, which I'm going to tell you about. Uh, a lot of uh, states, like we've done this with wild turkey and some other species, uh, when there's like no population left and they feel for the ecological balance, uh, they need to bring in certain uh, species, they will. And, and New York State decided that they needed to help repopulate their eagle population. And they only had this one nesting pair left. So they got young eaglets. They took them right out of the nest where they really even were very old, just a few weeks old. And uh, so one who came to be known as 03142 was whisked from his Minnesota nest and taken to New York's Montezuma Natural Wildlife Refuge, which is a pretty cool place with a few eaglets from other states. Uh, the biologists hoped that these eaglets would stick around after they, grew, they fledged, and some did. A few years later, the male of this nest died and 03142 took his place in the old nest at Hemlock Lake. And over the next few decades, he, he fathered many young eaglets. Um, so they did get a big comeback in New York State. Um, so the yellow wing tags, that, that was, uh, they didn't use a band, they use a wing tag and that's 03142. And he was a graduate of their restoration problem. He, uh, uh, he did die 25 miles away. Uh, he was eating uh, a dead rabbit on the side of the road and uh, he was hit by a car. Um, at the time, he was 38 years old. 
So they think he was feeble and weak by that time and really couldn't fish. And so he was on the road eating carrion, although carrion or dead stuff is one of the uh, eagle's first ways of getting food because they don't have to expend much energy. So they can swoop down, you know, grab a dead squirrel and move along. Uh, recently on my road, uh, something happened to a deer. We think it was weak and probably got killed by coyotes and it was right beside the side of the road and I'm kind of on a woods road. So it was right before a storm, I think. I forget what it was, or it was a weekend. So I asked our town if they could just move it in the woods so people wouldn't have to watch, see it all weekend. And they moved it. And then all of a sudden, I would go by there. There'd be eight ravens on it. And then I saw three bald eagles all at once eating off of that dead deer. So uh, so that they do like to eat that carrion. Uh, there's the band of the, the dead eel. Uh, that's the federal band is silver, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but this is how they know they put bands on young eaglets be uh, before they fledge, and that's how we can sometimes track them. So it was banded on August 7, 1977. Uh, pretty incredible. So here's the species. It's a big bird. The females are about a third larger. Um, they, it's called sexual dimorphism, uh, where the female is larger than the male. Uh, she's considerably larger, and it's almost impossible to tell unless they're sitting side by side. But there is one way you can tell a male if you can see it sitting with its tail towards you. Uh, their primary feathers, which are those big wings, uh, they will uh, go kind of cover over the white tail and because uh, they project out and extends the tip of the tail so and it does not do that on the female so those are two ways of telling being smaller the male is slightly quicker and more agile giving him an advantage in fishing and catching prey uh, her large size helps her incub incubate the eggs and brood the young chicks uh, she can use her body to shelter them from cold soaking range or hot sun they both will sit on the eggs. The male will take over for a short time so the female can go out and shake her wings and stretch and dry off, but not for long. And hey guys, I always notice the male, he'll be sitting there on the nest and you see him looking around like, hey, when are you coming back? I'd rather fish. So anyway, uh, Northern Eagles are larger than Southern Eagles. And that's also true in black bears. Um, it has to do with, a, if you like science, it's called the Bergman's rule, B-E-R-G-M-A-N-N-S. And what that says is that body size is large in cold climates and small in warm climates, because um, large bodies have a smaller surface area to volume ratios. In cold climates where you need to retain heat, bodies are larger and more compact. And in warm climates where you need to expel heat, bodies are smaller and more linear. So that's the reason for that. So here you see the sizes. A female bald eagle's wingspan can go up to eight feet and she can weigh 14 pounds. That's a pretty large one. You know, typically she'd probably be more like uh, seven feet and uh, 13 pounds. The males around here usually average eight to 10 pounds and their wings are generally up to about six feet but could go to seven, but that's more unusual. So here you can see the female's quite larger, even her head is larger. Um, you know, not hard to tell that when they're sitting side by side. And sometimes you can tell even if they're not side by side because she just is a lot larger. These are some eagles on Bantam Lake. Um, you can see the female on the right. And there's one I took on the Farmington River. Uh, and you can see this is a male because you can see those primary feathers are extending over the, <laughs> the white tail. Excuse me, I gotta take a sip of water. So a bald eagle has 7,200 feathers and they're hollow and they make up seven to 10% of its weight. And I like to say, oh my gosh, like it's kind of like those pennies. And they say, how many pennies are in the jar? It's like, who sits there and counts these feathers? But there are ways they do it. 30% uh, of their feathers are on their heads. Uh, their bones are also hollow and only take up five to 6% of their body weight compared to the bones of humans, which take up 20%. So that's pretty uh, big difference. Um, if you're into the anatomy, uh, here's their feathers and what they do. Uh, the primaries, those big ones, provide the thrust. The secondaries provide lift. 
and the retroses provide braking and steering, not unlike an airplane, if you look at it really. Uh, here's an eagle I got a photo of on the Farmington River. Uh, you can see as it turns those big wings and it does use its tail as a rudder and the primary feathers, those little uh, fingers that help them uh, get lift and steer as well. My friend Cheryl took these photos of a bald eagle taking off of a tree. And uh, you can see it's quite remarkable to get its big self lifted up and away. Here's a picture of one that I took it, when they're in a thick bunch of trees, because they have such big wings, they have to do like a free fall until they're away from the trees before they can spread those big wings out. So uh, this is the profile, the most common profile of a bald eagle um, soaring. Uh, it's called planking, kind of like a two by four. Uh, so they'll have their legs Jenny. up. Yes. Jenny, your screen is frozen. You're not, we're not seeing your pictures. You're not? No, we're just on the picture with the wings. Okay, you got that one. Is it moving now? No. Oh, okay. I don't know why. Let me see. Um, okay, hold on. I mean, it's, it's moving for me. Let me go back a little. Nothing's moving. The big wings was all you saw last. Right. We're on the flight feathers functions. Okay. All right. I guess I, let me reshare it. Uh, uh, let's see. Hold on. Did it move then? Yes. Okay. So these are taking flight. Uh, so these are photos by my friend Cheryl. I have no idea why that sort of thing happens, but sorry. Uh, so here's a free fall. So this, this bird was in like a hardwood tree and uh, to get down, it was over the river. It has to pull its wings up and do a free fall because uh, they're so, so large. So here's that profile when they soar. Uh, if you've ever watched bald eagles, they flap their wings very little unless they're trying to go really quick uh, after something and they'll catch those thermals and go up, up and up, which is that hot air circular uh, you'll see vultures doing that. That's called, so when these birds are doing that, that's the kettle of eagles or a kettle of vultures. Uh, they use that air uh, to save energy. Um, so the Washington Sea Eagle, the famed ornithologist, most of y'all know John James Audubon, he heard that there was this uh, great new eagle out along the Mississippi River in 1814. So he hired a guide and he, he wanted to find this mightiest of the feathered tribe, as he called it. So he went out with a guide and other ornithologists were there and he saw this eagle and he's like, oh, I've discovered a new eagle. Meanwhile, other people had already seen it, but he was a pretty arrogant guy. And so he named it the Washington Sea Eagle. And then he came back that night to the bar or wherever they hang out back then and said, I've discovered a new eagle and all these ornithologists were laughing at him because it was an immature bald eagle. So even the experts can be wrong sometimes. And that brings us to how the bald eagle gets into its <laughs> white head. Um, juvenile eagles, which are called juveniles in their first year after they've fledged the nest, uh, they're a mixture of brown and white. They have that dark beak, dark eyes, as you can see on the left. Um, and as they mature, uh, they start moving towards, so the one in the top right is between three and four years old. The bottom right is what we call a sub-adult, uh, and that you can see it's starting to get its white head. Um, here's kind of a progression, and again, all of the eagles will change a little bit differently, and sometimes some of the um, bald eagles who are in birds of prey shows because <clears throat> their development is arrested once they become not captive, but when they can't go back out in the wild anymore. Uh, but this is a typical progression. You can see that as the beak starts changing from their first year. So their second and third year, they're called um, immature bald eagles and their fourth year, they're called sub-adults. So uh, here you can see this one, uh, it's full size. They're full size when they leave the nest. Their wings are a little less muscular, but basically they're, they're the adult size, but they have different colorations. So here's a fledgling in Bantam Lake. <clears throat> so you can see very dark uh, first year plumage. 
uh, they're, they're flying, the one on the left is dark. My friend Leo took these pictures, Leo Kalinsky, and on the right, he and I stand out on the ice for many, many hours to try to get pictures of the eagles. Uh, there you see one with a little more white that I was able to get. Uh, this one is uh, a juvenile. Uh, so you can see they can be quite different looking. So sometimes they'll go, wow, look, that's like uh, almost like a red-tailed hawk in the front with the white. Um, and then there's a third year plumage. This one has a lot of white on the front, uh, but you can see the tail down at the bottom starting to uh, turn. And this is by Paul Fusco, who's the DEP photographer. Uh, <clears throat> again, here's one that's white. And a lot of people would see this and almost think it was an osprey, you know, just because of the coloration. Uh, here you can see this one on the left with an adult and the fourth year plumage. Here's a great photo uh, by my friend Cheryl of, uh, one going into the subadult, you see the white head turning, tail still pretty dark, but by the time it's five, they'll get lose the white on their body and have white heads and white tails. Uh, here's another subadult, a uh, little different. This one's a little more turned, so that's their whole progression. So there you can see the one on the right, a uh, female and uh, a male on the left. Uh, so pretty interesting, and, and they are, as I said, they are mistaken a lot of times for other uh, types of birds, uh, a lot of times mistaken as well for a golden eagle. Uh, so fifth, uh, fifth year plumage, I mean, it is a gorgeous bird. As you can see, those feathers are just gorgeous. Um, their iris and their bill have transformed to the bright yellow color. And uh, this is a male. You can see those primary feathers. They come across his white tail. So look at that closely that's another great way to identify so these are not to scale the osprey is a much smaller bird than the bald eagle but whenever you do these side by side comparisons it's hard but um, they're sometimes confused by one another because they frequent similar habitats and they're known to compete over food uh, in fact the bald eagle generally steals from the osprey we call the osprey the saint patrick's day bird because it comes back to us around march 17th um, they do exhibit some similarities to juvenile bald eagles. They have brownish fur with white modeling on their body. Uh, they do have a dark colored bill, uh, but their irises are yellow. Uh, and uh, the shape of their bills and body is really key to their, their differences. Uh, the bald eagle's beak, as you can see, is more curved, bigger, uh, and sharper compared to the osprey. But the osprey is pretty amazing, and I bring it up because it is live. It does cohabitate with the eagles. They have a laundry list of ad adaptations that are absent in hawks that feed on terrestrial prey. It's a plunge diver exclusively. It'll go towards the water. It tucks its wings backwards, dives in feet first, and it generally will go underwater, whereas the eagle will not. Uh, the soles of its feet have these tiny, sharp tubercules, they're called, and they create a non-slip surface for gripping the fish better. Their outermost toes can swing back to their rear toe, which is called their hallux, and that provides them with a two front, two back foot position that makes it easy to handle wriggling fish. They have dense, really oily feathers that help protect them, you know, from when they're wet. So you can see the difference, you know, bald eagle, osprey. Osprey is really very white, but you saw some of those pictures of the immatures and some of them are pretty white, but that osprey always has that mask on its face. Uh, so again, bald eagle is eight to 14 pounds. The osprey on average is two to 4.25 pounds. So a huge difference in weight there. Here's how, <clears throat> here's how they both approach the water. Um, they learn to specialize, uh, both of them, in particular prey in a hunting territory, and so they develop a set. So they kind of know, like owls, they kind of know what their territory is, you know, where that rock is, where this little place is that a trout might be hanging out behind it. And the more often they find a particular food, the better they are at finding it. Um, that allows them to pick out prey against the confusion of surroundings. So. Uh, our bald eagle, this is one thing that uh, Ben Franklin didn't like about it, is a kleptoparasite. <laughs> and a kleptoparasite is a term for an animal that steals a meal from another animal. Uh, this form of hunting is quite common. It occurs in nature with, from mollusks to mammals and at least 197 species of birds. So, you know, size of bird, size of animal. 
I was in Simsbury one day driving from, I never know the roads, you know, what they're called, but from the road that goes by Miss Porter's, I um, mean, I'm sorry, Ethel Walker, and I was going over to Route 10. And it's a small road, but all of a sudden I see these two, I see this big bald eagle was on the swooping down onto the road and there was a red-tailed hawk with a squirrel. So I just stopped my car. There wasn't any shoulder. I got out. Luckily, I had a camera with me and got this bald eagle haranguing the red-tailed hawk. And the hawk dropped the squirrel. The squirrel ran away, but the eagle just continued to harangue the hawk. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. Uh, so again, here you see the bald eagle chasing it. The osprey is much better at fishing. Uh, the bald eagle, not so good. Um, so that's why they sometimes will steal. So bald eagles get their food typically from dead stuff first, then from stealing and the third way hunting. Um, the osprey is generally gets about seven out of 10 times it gets a fish. The bald eagle is at best 50%. Uh, when the bald eagle sticks those legs out uh, above the water before it uh, grabs a fish, it can't see the fish anymore. So then it's catch as catch can. I don't like cliches, but this one works with the eagle. Uh, so here you see this osprey. Their eyes are obviously sitting in the tree and the eyes are looking. It must have seen a fish and there it goes. This is my friend Cheryl took this. And here it is. She took this into the water. It has just come up again with quite a splash. Uh, and... Uh, is carry proportionately more weight than the bald eagle in proportion to its size. So the bald eagle can generally only carry about four pounds. If it gets a duck or something, it has to swim it to shore. Bald eagles can swim, but you know, in the winter it can be dangerous because they can get hypothermia. A lot of times they'll pick off part of the duck and then go up to a tree and eat the head or whatever and then come back for it. So, uh, so again, here you see it started. They always start eating at the head because that's the part that could injure them possibly. Um, so you can see that black stripe on their head. That's very clearly where you can see it. I, I take my friend out in the canoe with his big cam camera equipment and uh, he doesn't swim. But I said, oh, I got to get a picture of a fish, you know, an eagle with a fish. So I, you got to just hang on. I'm going to put my paddle up, you know. So I, this is my only, only shot I've gotten of an eagle with a fish. But you can see he's looking right at me thinking, you're not getting this fish. So, um, and here's an eagle on the Farmington River I took, uh, giving kind of a stern look. So here's their head. Eyesight, all eagles are renowned for their excellent eyesight, uh, thus the term eagle-eyed. Eagles, like all birds, have color vision. Uh, their eagle, their eye is, uh, is the size of a grown man's, even though their weight is roughly a 20th of a human being. The sharpness of their eyes is at least four times that of a person with perfect vision. They can identify a rabbit moving almost a mile away, and they will take small animals sometimes. Uh, that means an eagle flying at an altitude of a thousand feet over open country could spot prey over a area of almost three square miles. I say Superman move over. Uh, again, they do hunt by eyesight, uh, but their eyes are stationary, so they have to move their heads to see objects. They do have 3D vision, which is the same as binocular vision, and that means that both of their eyes focus on an object at the same time, and this is a big requirement for a fast hunter that has to gauge distance to its meal. Uh, they have a, a nicotating membrane, which other animals like uh, bobcats have them, beavers have them. It's an opaque covering over their eyes that keeps debris out and they can see through it. So that's a very important thing for the eagle. Uh, again, if you're into anatomy, here's the different parts. Um, you can see their beaks get pretty beat, beat up. <laughs> so, but their head is suited for survival. Uh, their feet or talons are the business end of the eagles. They have four toes. The rear toe or the hallux is like our big toe. Uh, their, ta their talons are made out of keratin, just like our uh, fingernails, and they can grow up to two inches long, pretty big. 
they do have a mechanism in their talons that lock the talons while they're sitting on a branch. You ever wondered how they could sleep there and not twirl around like a cartoon bird? Uh, that's how they just have to bend their leg to unlock them. Uh, all animals, what's important, what do they need to survive? They need food, nests, roosts, privacy, and healthy environment. Although we have learned that a lot of our eels, like a lot of our animals, have become what we call ex-urban, which means they do tolerate a certain amount of suburbanization or urbanization. Uh, just think of Connecticut. We're over just over 3 million acres and uh, just over um, 3 million people, and we're heavily fragmented by roads. So most of our wildlife are going to have to have you know, some, uh, you know, contact with humans. I always said if I was a deer or a fox, I'd hang out at a golf course, you know, so I couldn't be shot, but they don't know, they're not privy to that information. Anyway, 90% of their uh, diet is fish, and I told you how they obtain their food. During the winter and uh, in harsh climates, they'll perch for 90% of their time. Uh, sometimes they'll feed one day. If they can, they can skip a day and, and hold some food in their crop. They need about a pound and a half of food per day with a minimum of half a pound. So a lot of food. So you can imagine when they start feeding those eagle, uh, eaglets, uh, they got to that they got to bring a lot of food. Again, they do fly up to 10,000 feet at average speeds of 30 to 35 miles per hour. And if you're sitting and watching an eagle, I'll give you a hint. They generally a lot of times before they take off, they will poop. That's kind of gross, but that's a tip off. And then they'll take off and they really go fast. Once they get those wings going, they, they can be out of your viewfinder pretty quickly. Uh, they can only dive at about 50 miles per hour, so much uh, uh, slower than the golden eagle. Um, again, it is a strong swimmer, but if it's cold, they could be overcome by hypothermia. In normal times, non-nesting times, their hunting area can vary up from 1,700 to 10,000 acres. Um, their home areas are smaller when their food is abundant. So it all, you know, like all animals, it all depends on weather and abundancy. Um, they have been known they'll eat muskrats, ducks, gulls, turtles, uh, all kinds of fish, snakes, and sometimes even small domestic livestock if, if say, the rivers are frozen and they can't get food. Um, again, they don't really dive. They put their feet out. If they don't catch something, then they, they move on. So here's one with a fish. <clears throat> As you can see, flying along, it's going to go up somewhere and eat it. Uh, right now, our uh, eagles are about to be mating. Uh, so... Uh, they share duties in nest building, which you'll see as we go along. Uh, but obviously the survival and recovery of bald eagles and other animals are dependent on our clean water and availability of he healthy fish and aquatic life. So again, as I said, uh, it's important in all kinds of organizations like land trusts, the Farm Tree Watershed Association that I'm on, uh, all of these places do try to protect all of this habitat and we all should do what we can as well. Um, here you can see this one with those big wings. Uh, it's just amazing when they fly over you. If, you. if you fish the West Branch of the Farmington River, a lot of fishermen have eagles flying them all, over them all the time and it's quite spectacular. Uh, here's one you can see getting about ready into the West Branch to go down and try to catch something. So here's an eagle on carrion. Um, that e those eagles on my street, I was like, oh my gosh. I, so I I got out, tried to get a picture. Of course, the ravens fly, the, the eagles fly, and then I came back with camo on, hid behind the tree, and I sat in the cold snow and waited two hours, and the eagles never came back, and because the ravens were up there making all rock, 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 making all this noise, and even though I was very hidden, those ravens are very smart, and they knew I was there, and the eagles were certainly not going to come back as long as they heard that noise. Uh, a lot of times birds will also watch if a if a squirrel goes and hides really quick, that might be mean a red-shouldered hawk or some other predators around. So the, the birds will all go away for a little while. So all these animals know these little signs uh, and can figure it out. Uh, this is my friend Cheryl. She goes out early in the morning and she saw this crow that was eating a possum. So this eagle decided, I want that possum. So he chased the, the, the crow away. And here an eagle's taking 
some kind of prey away from a red-tailed hawk. So when they roost together, they're pretty congenial. They just want to find a protected area away from the wind where they can just roost for the night. Uh, so they'll, they might travel 12 miles from their feeding site uh, to a roosting site. Um, and again, they try to get protection from wind or vegetation in a favorable environment with some thermal air coming through. So a lot of times you'll see them, you'll see eagles hanging out. This is in Alaska and they just hang out together. I mean, unless there was somebody threw a fish there, there's no reason to fight each other. So traditionally bald eagles have chosen remote areas for nesting. Uh, they used to prefer white pine trees. They do get tall trees with a canopy over them. If they lose the canopy, like one of ours on the reservoir here in Bark Hampstead, then they're just totally, you know, the elements will totally uh, take care of things. Uh, like, you know, Connecticut's typical for getting a big snow in late March or early April and then followed by heavy winds and rain. Well, by that time, the eagle's sitting on her eggs and, and sometimes she'll be completely covered with snow. It's just amazing how they can even <clears throat> keep these. Uh, but in Connecticut now, we have had some nests made near shopping centers in Hamden. There's one in a cemetery in New Haven. So they're not quite as remote as they used to be, uh, like uh, where the Enfield Dam is. They closed the Windsor Locks Canal because the wintering eagles used to come down there to uh, the island there, and they still close it to, because they, they do still try to protect these nests so they don't disturb the eagles. Uh, <clears throat> so both the male and female eagles are determined and prodigious architects when it comes to their nest. They'll get together typically in January. They don't hang, hang around with each other after their uh, young have fledged, but they'll come together. And we're seeing some come together in November now, which is kind of interesting, but it could be with the climate change. Uh, and they'll each take materials to the nest. Their nests are called Aries, A-E-R-I-E-S. Um, here you see one just come off of that uh, conifer and is flying. Um, they use sticks and twigs up to three inches in diameter and three to four feet long. I saw an eagle one time bouncing on a dead limb until it cracked off and then it took it to a nest. Uh, they'll line the nest with pine needles, grass, and evergreen to make it cushy. Uh, and they'll build a nest cup in the middle for where they'll put the eggs. Um, eagles do mate for life. Uh, and they will be showing up their nests in January and early February, and soon they'll be, be mating time. So they'll even bring just sticks. Uh, the male will continue to bring sticks even once the female uh, is on the eggs. Um, here you can see the smaller type of stuff they bring. Sometimes the, on average, the, mess, the nest can measure about seven to eight feet across, and that's a flat mass of sticks. And, and they're big. When you look in the tree, you know that's an eagle's nest. Uh, um, and uh, generally, they'll be pretty high off the ground. Um, the female is the one who does arrange stuff when, when they get all the material in the nest. And then she'll make the nest uh, cup, which is about the same size as her body, to hold the eggs. And it'll have all kinds of soft materials underneath it. Here's the stages of our typical nesting season, it, although it, you know things have changed a little bit. Uh, they'll start nest building anywhere, you know, from January into March, uh, some quicker. They lay their eggs uh, from February to March. Uh, they incubate them up to 35 days. Uh, and then in April, generally, they'll have their young. Uh, the largest bald eagle nest ever recorded was in St. Petersburg, Florida. It measured almost 10 feet wide and 20 feet deep. And they asked, this is it, they estimated it weighed more than two tons, 4,409 pounds. That's another thing I want to know. How the heck did they, <laughs> did they weigh that? They must have gathered up all the sticks and weighed them. I don't know. Here's one at a, at a wildlife preserve in the Midwest. Just, uh, it's not, it's man-made, but they're just to show people how it sits in the trees, uh, trunks, and how big it can be. Here you see both uh, adults are in the nesting tree. This is uh, while they're still building the nest. Uh, it'll be weeks before the female lays her eggs. Uh, again, they do mate for life unless they're unsuccessful at producing chicks, and then they'll look for another mate. Uh, after the eaglets have grown to full size and fledged, uh, 
within a month after that, the adults will go their separate ways. They will feed the uh, the young after they fledge for about a, a month. None of them hang in their nest until it's time to add materials and get ready for another uh, nesting cycle. So here the eagles are there. I always said that's a that's a good Valentine shot. And there they are. You can see there are a lot of pretty thick sticks in there and they just keep adding to it every year. So it just gets bigger and bigger, uh, quite remarkable. And this is not the largest nest, uh, but uh, it's pretty sizable. Uh, so you see they have a little canopy over them, but not a lot. Um, this was taken in early March. Uh, she has, she's on the eggs. You can see her eye kind of to the right. You can see uh, that golden eye. Um, so she has to keep those eggs uh, uh, really warm. They, it, even a second off of them can, can make them where they're not viable. Uh, to mate, they have the famous dance. Uh, they mate, uh, again, as I said, they mate for life. When it comes to courtship, I think bald eagles uh, put the wild in wildlife. Uh, this maneuver is known as the cartwheel display or death spiral, and it's chief among their spectacular courtship. They do not mate in the air. They soar up high altitude, they lock their talons, and they tumble and cartwheel towards earth. Uh, they, they do let go before reaching the ground, except for when they don't. <laughs> in 2014, two adult eagles' talons were locked, and they were found tangled in a tree in Portland, Oregon. Uh, they eventually broke free and flew off. We just recently had one in Connecticut where their talons were locked and they had to be unlocked. So. Uh, quite a remarkable display. So here you can see the female on the left, uh, uh, and that's the one I told you that has the atypical uh, black in her tail, but those are not primary feathers hanging over her tail. So uh, here's how they mate, not to be crude, but this is how they do mate. <clears throat> here's our reproduction. Uh, it's approximately 120 days, uh, lasts from the start of the egg laying process until the eaglets are fledged. Fledged means when they leave the nest, uh, they lay five to ten, 10 days after they mate. Uh, and they'll lay one egg at a time, which is typical of a lot of, pre of, a lot of animals. Uh, and uh, they would have one to four eggs. Our average is two and a half to three. Uh, they'll incubate from up to 36 days. Um, and they do share the duties. They will switch off a little because the female does have to get stretched out a little freezing will kill the embryo, and the hatching occurs over 48 hours. Uh, one will be born, and generally the first one survives because guess what? The eagles will feed the firstborn more than the others because they feel in their heads there's a better survival rate. So the other little ones have to just take whatever scraps are left. So it's uh, sometimes not so good for the third one particularly. This is really interesting, uh, the brood patch. It's an area on the parent's chest that does not have feathers. Uh, it's the part that will touch the eggs. Have you ever seen an eagle settle on an egg? They're kind of like parallel to the ground. Uh, you know, they're not sitting straight up. So if you see, like right now, you'll see the eagles sitting straight up in the nest, but all of a sudden when their heads disappear, you know, she's out parallel, with, you know, tucked down over uh, incubating those eggs. Um, this brood patch allows for a more efficient transfer of heat to the eggs. Uh, not all birds will develop this, but in species like the bald eagle, both parents can develop it uh, because, as we can see, they share the incubation duties. Um, it starts to develop uh, on their breast or abdomen right before the female lays her eggs. And it's uh, this internal hormonal change that causes the feathers that cover that area to fall out on their own. And that leaves that wrinkled patch, uh, <clears throat> bare skin, and the blood vessels uh, fill with warm blood. Uh, if you see the female or male wiggle as they settle up on the eggs, they are spreading that bare patch over the eggs to keep them warm. So pretty, pretty incredible nature thing there uh, <clears throat> for that to happen, so. So eagles lay and incubate their eggs, as I said, late February to early March. They look kind of like goose eggs. Um, two to four days pass between each egg. Um, incubation takes five weeks, uh, or up to five weeks. Depending on the weather, 
uh, as I said, they can't leave the eggs for more than, you know, like a minute at the most. Um, so if there's disturbances that flush the, the adults from the nest, it can result in death of embryos. That's another reason why they don't like a lot of people around the nest. Because even though the nests are high up, it's still a disruption. So here's what they look like when they come out. <clears throat> During the process of hatching, the chick employs an egg tooth. If you look in that little uh, um, egg on the left, you'll see this little white thing. Well, that's the egg tooth that you see there on that on that eaglet. And that's what they use to crack the shell and that will disappear. So again, nature always provides some cool stuff. So here they are, uh, they're three to four ounces when they're born. They can't lift their head for two days. Uh, they grow pretty fast, a rate, of, a rate of one pound a week. By the third week, they're almost a foot tall. How would you like your kids to grow that fast? <clears throat> Four to five weeks, they can stand and move. And they're nearly full grown between uh, six and seven weeks. Um, at eight weeks, they'll start standing at the edge of the nest and flap their wings, which is really cool. And then they'll move off to the branches, which is called branching. And uh, they'll flap their wings a lot until they kind of get a little stronger. Um, uh, so again, they, the male and female will trade places and that's kind of a cool thing to see. Uh, once the eaglets hatch, <clears throat> they have to have warmth and protection from the adults and they'll sit over them until they're about a few weeks old uh, because they can't thermoregulate their bodies at that age. Uh, they have to almost eat constantly, so the adults capture and tear the fish in the small strips. Um, and the chicks snatch the food pretty quickly and swallow it whole. Again, the male does most of the hunting because he is more agile. Uh, and the female does the majority of the feeding and brooding. Uh, an eagle chick will eat as much as it can at a single feeding, and it does store its food in the crop. And that's an organ you know, located near the base of the bird's neck. And sometimes it'll enlarge and be as almost as big as a, a golf ball. Uh, again, they are helpless, but I never understood this. Like, oh, they're totally helpless when they come into the world. Well, so are baby, <laughs> baby humans, you know. So, but uh, their vision, they're not blind, but their vision is limited and they can't stand up. Um, so, but they do grow quickly and they do want more and more food. So it becomes pretty, pretty busy time for the um, adults to feed them. Um, so here they are, little chicks waiting for their food. Uh, at about um, eight weeks, the appetites of the eaglets are at their greatest. The parents will have to hunt almost continuous, but they also have to feed themselves. So meanwhile, at the nest, the eaglets start stretching and moving around. So it's getting pretty crowded in the nest, uh, but they are getting stronger. Uh, at about nine to 10 weeks, as I said, they'll start doing branching, which is uh, the next phase before they fledge. And between 10 and 14 weeks, they will fledge or fly away from the nest. Uh, so there you see the male hunting. There's the little heads, pretty cute. There you can see the, the adult behind her, or it. <laughs> Mother feeding. So you can see that, that the young eagle's getting bigger, the eaglet. And there, now they're getting ready. You see they're branching. There's the one in the upper right. So there were two in this nest. So they're hanging out there, not too far from the nest, but getting out on the branch, completely down on the branch away from the nest, but still near the mom. Now this one's pretty dark. And here they are. Uh, it's my friend Brian Bennett who watches an eagle's nest. And here's the eagles when they're like, that nest you can see is built like just inside those trunks of that sycamore tree. And they'll just start moving their wings and trying to get ready about the idea of flying. Here again, you see this one has a little more white underneath it. So now they're both up there. And I always like to think the one on top's like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? <laughs> And there they are on the first flight. So uh, those are the two siblings. This was in July 17th, these birds took off. And here they are over on the tree. The one on the top was a little more 
nervous. And this other one was just really like flapping its wings and saying, hey, look what I can do. <laughs> Here's another different one. Again, just getting used to it. Uh, they do a little free fall when they take off until they learn how to, you know, use those wings. And some do plummet to the ground. I mean, that is part of the 50%. Uh, here they are flying together. They will start doing cartwheel dance, not as a mating thing, but just kind of playing because it's instinctual and it's, you know, what they need to learn to do. Uh, so how in the world do young eaglets get banded? Um, you, here you can see the biologist reaching in to get the big chick. They usually band them between six and eight weeks. Uh, they take a net and put it over uh, the eaglet. You say, well, where are the adults? Well, the adults think that's a pretty big bird, that guy. You know, they don't know what it is. So they usually go to a nearby tree and make all kinds of ruckus and just watch. And uh, then the buzz will, uh, the biologist will lower that chick into a bag and the other scientists will be waiting below. Uh, this bird is an interesting story I'll tell you about. Um, this one's uh, brother, uh, this one's called, my friend Brian named it Stephen Jr. He's having his talons measured. So the biologist will measure the talons, the beaks, the everything, take some DNA. Uh, they measure the feathers. Uh, the bit, beak width and length, uh, and then the eaglets wade and return to the nest pretty quickly. Uh, and typically they can hold them like this and they don't get scratched. Occasionally they might get beaked a little bit. Uh, but this one here is uh, B7, which Stephen Jr. TOO, uh, and you can see those talons, you know, pretty, pretty long. And that uh, band you see is the Connecticut band is black with white letters and the federal band is on the other leg and that's silver. So you actually can read the state bands a lot easier if you have a good lens or a good scope. Um, no North American bird grows faster than the eagles. Uh, so, so here, this is probably more water than these young birds have gotten since they were born because typically they get their water from whatever fish is brought to them. You know, there's no way of transporting water to them. So they try to give them a lot of water and give them a little hydration there. Um, it's about 39 days old here. Uh, so again, here we are putting a band on. And here's a band. Uh, you can see the federal band and the, the state band there. This is the only way we can measure and tell the movements and the age uh, of the eagles. Uh, it gives us information on how successful our birds are and where they disperse to. Uh, only chicks are banded. If there was an adult that was rescued and, and was let go, it would be tagged in some way. Uh, so um, here you can see a band on, on this bird. And my friend Cheryl saw this bird in Granby, not anywhere near water, but there's always water somewhere. And she took a photo and was able to blow it up and tell that this bird came from Michigan. And uh, so it has dispersed quite far. It was banded in 2017. So you get a certificate if you're able to, uh, you know, to take a photo and figure out the numbers. And that's what I want to bring. So here's the co common leg bands you see where we live. The silver is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the black Connecticut with white leathering, gold Massachusetts, blue New York, and green New Jersey. And that brings me to this bird. This, what, this bird was that B7 you just saw who was born in 2017. And this, he was just photographed on January 27th by Marcio Lemus Neri at Dobbs Ferry, New York. My friend Brian was very happy because this is one of the nests he watched and happy to see that this bird is surviving and doing quite well. Uh, so he is... Here he was, he was photographed uh, in um, 2018 on the left um, in Dobbs Ferry. In 2019, he had come back to Chapag Dam area in Southbury. Uh, he was originally banded in the Housatonic. And so this is really very exciting to see one of our own uh, uh, eagles and, uh, you know, coming back. He did come back in the winter, so he probably was... Uh, you know, he probably is not going to nest in New York, but he's coming here in the winter for uh, more open water. So very exciting uh, development. And there he is 
uh, just uh, a few days ago. So I want to tell you an interesting story about eagles. Uh, these eagles here, you can see star on the left, valor two in the middle and valor one. They're in Illinois sitting on their nest. And uh, what happened is star, proof that families come in all shapes and sizes, this nest has two dads and a mom in the upper Mississippi River Refuge. Um, they all take part in nest maintenance, incubation, and raising the young. This is called polyandry, where a female mates with more than one male, and both males help care for the nest. But this didn't happen naturally. Star was sitting on her eggs, and Valor One just deserted her, just left for what reason we don't know, just went away. And Valor Two came and helped out and got her food and everything. And so now they've all just hanging out there together. There is a webcam uh, at the Upper Mississippi Wildlife Refuge, so you could see that. Uh, it's not unheard of. Such trios have been documented, though, only a few times in Alaska, Minnesota, and California. Of course, there could be some of, of, of nests that we don't see. Um, so pretty interesting. So how can I see, how can we see eagles? Uh, in the bird world, uh, the smaller birds tend to bug the bigger birds when the bigger birds are sitting or flying along. You'll see sparrows that, that go after crows or crows after, you know, vultures or eagles. This uh, is called mobbing. And what it is is a way to point out that a predator is there. And it's also just to annoy them because a bird of prey can't turn all of a sudden, you know, and grab something. It can only be down on it. So crows have a certain call when they spot an eagle. Um, if you see a tree where you see like a lot of crows hanging out there, there's probably some bird of prey, likely an owl in there. But uh, when you hear a lot of crows cackling, you can figure there's some kind of predator around. Uh, the, the crow, when, uh, when it's uh, bothering an eagle, makes a sound similar to a raven. It's like a bawk, bawk, kind of like that, uh, given very quickly and repeated several times. Um, but it will chase the eagles like this. And sometimes you'll see more than one. It'll just fly around and annoy them, you know, just because it can. So uh, that's a good way if you see, you know, birds following uh, to see them. But actually in Connecticut, you know, get some sandwiches, go hang out at the Farmington River somewhere. Uh, a little harder at the Connecticut River. Uh, you know, there are some places in Enfield where there's landings you can sit uh, and oftentimes see eagles. Eagles fly throughout the day, but they, they tend to feed more in the morning and evening. Um, so uh, listen to this. I'll let you hear a few sounds. Uh, so you can't tell me what you think this is, but I'll play them both and then you can tell me. So later, I'll tell you. That's not it. <laughs> So th this noise up here, that's what Hollywood and a lot of advertisements tell you is an eagle. That's actually a red-tailed hawk. An eagle just makes this little chirrup noise and they have a little scream sort of, uh, but they, they have a very meek voice for a very mighty individual. So uh, here's that red-tailed hawk. And again, a way to tell a red haw tailed hawk in a tree is a white breast with a brown band across its chest. This one's not quite so definitive, but, uh, and the red tail, of course. Uh, here's some other, I was in a kayak and got this, so you'll hear a lot of water. Usually that's a sound like the, the young will make or the female when she's saying, come on already, you need to bring us some food. 
Here's another one. So it's just a little peep, not what you would think a mighty bird would have. So, so here's another one. Let's see. So just a little peep. I have to, I'm not very good with like uh, media like that. I should shorten that, but so you don't have to listen to the waves so much. But anyway, uh, so thanks to my friends for the photos along with my own photos. And long may they soar.